Revival here at South Oak Ridge, and if you're a guest, we're especially glad to have you with us tonight as we just come together to worship and to give the honor and the glory and the praise of Jesus Christ. And uh, we had our Wednesday night dinner tonight. Thank you for everyone who came and was a part of that and for those who served. And um, one other announcement, this Saturday evening from 4 to 6 at Courtney Baptist Church, the Yadkin Baptist Association is sponsoring a dinner for veterans and their spouses. You can drive through and pick up your dinner. It's a barbecue uh, dinner for you as an appreciation for all you've done for our country and as you serve faithfully. And our uh, veterans play a, a major role in our community and we greatly appreciate them this past weekend on Sunday at the prayer walk as they were a part of us there as leading us with the flag and uh, just uh, taking care of what they are challenged to do in our community. We say thank you to each of them. So mark that down if you're a veteran or a spouse, and please pass the word of that so we can have them to come to be a part. And uh, once again, it is the final week of our Samaritan's Purse shoe boxes. if you make a note of that, as we uh, will take those up uh, the final Sunday, and then next week we'll pack the boxes. So make sure you have that on your calendar as well and just keeping with that. And we're going to take an offering here. I'll invite our gentleman up here if we open with prayer, if you'd like to give to our revival. And... Uh, as the Lord leads you in any way that you may see or not. and uh, But we are so thankful that Dr. Schofield has been with us to share the Word of God faithfully these past uh, four nights, as three nights and Sunday, as he comes tonight to just to teach us. And uh, Sharon Yell is going to sing for us here in just a moment as she'll come, and just a time of worship and celebration and then the joy of serving our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we're together here to honor the Savior. And I'll have Jamie Hutchins pray for us tonight. stand and sing have faith in God
Good evening. It's good to be with you tonight. It's always a blessing to be at South Oak Ridge. I just feel at home being with you guys. And I know that this week has been an anxious time for our country. And, um, you know, the encouraging thing that I keep trying to remind myself is God knew what today would look like. He knows what tomorrow looks like. And, and he's with us, and he's still in control. I hope this song will encourage you. It's not a new one, but I was asked to sing it, so I hope it will encourage you tonight. You may be down and feel that God has somehow forgotten that you are faced with circumstances you just can't get through and right now it seems that there's no way out and you're going under but god's proven time and time again he'll take care of you and he'll do it again he'll do it again if you just take a look at where you are now and where you've been hasn't he always come through for you he's the same now as then you may not know how you may not know when but he'll do it again god knows the things that we're all going through and he knows how we're hurting and he knows just how your heart it's broken in two. Oh, but you see, he's the God of the stars, the sun and the seas, and he is our father. And he can calm the storm, and he'll find a way to fix this for you. And he'll do it. If you just take a look at where we are now and where we've been, hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same now as then. Amen. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it. Like a Moses, like old Daniel, like a Shadrach and Meshach and the
Praise the Lord. Great to be with you tonight again in the house of the Lord. Uh, we've had an interesting 24 hours uh, as a nation. Uh, we, I think, are seeing more and more the um, <clears throat> effects of sin and uh, corruption in the life of this nation. We see it. Uh, in many different levels, uh, of course, we talked about that uh, last night and the night before, the, the political, social, um, uh, and the sin and the moral and the spiritual levels we've seen, uh, the sin just being rampant. We, we've really gotten a taste of it, I think, in the midst of our processes of what's happening in the life of our nation who would have ever thought that we would be watching what's happening in the life of our political process take place in this day and this hour um, but what we do know about it all is that God is at work in the midst of it and God is drawing his people to himself and uh, we can rest assured that our great God has been uh, for some time now trying to get our attention as his people. And he continues to do that by disciplining, by squeezing, by uh, uh, causing calamity and unrest around us. And uh, what that does in our lives is creates uncertainty and the purpose of that is always God's loyal is his his what we call his hesed love for his people he is desiring that we return to him and in a relationship with him as his people and 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 he wants to do great and wondrous things through his people that we could never even think about I believe with all my heart that God wants to send a great movement of his spirit. We're way overdue as a nation. We're way overdue as a church in America. Uh, it's been over a hundred years since we've seen a massive, pervasive movement of God. And folks, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing the desperate need that we're having right now for that kind of a movement of God. One heart at a time being transformed by the power of the gospel. But in the midst of it, there are multitudes of hearts that are transformed uh, one heart at a time. And what that does is it, it, it transforms a culture. It changes a, a people. It changes nations. It changes communities. It changes, uh, if you will, states. It, it changes areas. When the gospel uh, moves forward in such a rapid way in what we call spiritual awakenings, it transforms areas. It transforms uh, the lives of people. And so when that happens, it transforms cultures. And that's what God wants to do. And if we, as his people, his people who are called by his name, will humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. Now that's an interesting thing interesting word from God's word, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, to seek his face. The reason we seek his face is because his back's to us. We seek his face. It's an anthropomorphism. And what God is, what is, what is he saying in scripture is that man, we look at him in that sense of, 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 of and understand him from the sense of, of, of our perspective as human beings. It's God being looking at us and having his favor upon us. And when we have to seek his face, it means that his back is to us because of our sin. And he says, you seek my face and you turn from your wicked ways and then I will hear from heaven 
and I will forgive your sin and I will heal your land. And in the midst of it is relationship. He draws us to relationship to himself. And that is his great desire. And I can tell you that in the midst of this, people, uh, you know, are saying, well, what about all this unrest that's present right now? Uh, people burning flags in the streets. We see the unrest in some of our larger cities and areas, and uh, we see uh, the difficulties we're having uh, with the election process. And we see all of this. But I can guarantee you that in the midst of it is the redemptive work of God. And that's what he's doing. And so as his people, we can, we can fear what's happening. Or we can fear him. And reverently look to him as his people. And set our eyes on him. Fix our eyes on him the author and perfecter of our faith. And that's what I hope we will do in these days. When Corona came, people were asking me, what's God saying? I was saying, well, we need to look to the Lord and find out what he's saying. That is something that must happen right now in the life of the church in America. What's God saying? Over this week, we've been looking at the seasons when God brings revival. I told you last night, I believe that we are in the midst of a time when God is truly disciplining us. And he's truly judging us in a remedial way. That means that it's not the final judgment. And, and in those seasons... God can bring revival when his people, like Isaiah, and we looked at Isaiah, when Isaiah became desperate for God, he, he, he was desperate to see the Lord, and he saw the Lord. And, and I believe we're in that season in the church in America. But I also believe that if we do not become desperate, we will, we will move into a different season. And that's the third season that I want to talk to you about this week. And that's the season when God brings revival through devastation. God devastates his people. Now, we don't like this. And this is not something that is very popular. You're not going to have a feel-good sermon tonight. But it's the truth of God. And we must be, as a people, we must be uh, uh, God's people who will be honest with what we see happening. And what God has done before in Scripture and what he has done historically. And realize that we could experience this kind of judgment that we're going to look at tonight as his people. Because God is a God of great justice. Amen? He is a God of great love. But his loyal Hesed love is just love. And sometimes he has to draw the line in the sand. It's like the 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 discipline of children. I remember one of my girls uh, sat down at the table. She was having difficulty with one of her children, a little boy. He was a curious George, and he was getting into everything, got in trouble with his grandparents on the other side's house, got in trouble at church that day, and got in trouble at our house. And they, she, she looked at me, and her husband looked at me, and they said, where did he come from? <laughs> I said, it came from y'all. <laughs> I said, the thing about it is, uh, honey, I said, uh, for some reason you got your, 
your, uh, your baby sister's children because what goes around comes around and it ought to be coming around to her. <laughs> but it's coming around to you. But you spent your life trying to keep her out of trouble. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but he had gotten into trouble. She said, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> and we had been praying. You know, as parents, you never quit parenting. You spend your life uh, walking with your kids. And, and, uh, and I said, well, well uh, I'm glad you asked. Because what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to increase the heat. And my daughter is, is a very um, a compliant child, she was. Her husband was a very compliant child. And uh, they are just mild-mannered. And uh, I said, but you're going to have to really, really tear that hiney up. <laughs> you just got to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and they have. And it's made all the difference in the world. And sometimes God has to tear our hineys up, y'all. And I believe we're on the verge of him really having to ramp it up in our lives as his people before we will ever, ever return to him in godliness and holiness. Now, what happened in the lives of God's people in Nehemiah, if you'll turn with me to Nehemiah 1, and we're going to look there tonight is that God brought revival through devastation. There are pictures of this throughout all of Scripture when God devastates his people in the New Testament and the Old Testament. If you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament and the quick judgment that came in their lives. And the Scripture is very clear to say and show that when that happened, when they had sinned against God, and they had skinned against the Holy Spirit of God, that God uh, brought swift judgment upon them and took their lives. And, and it says, the scripture says, that great fear fell upon the people of God. And God's purpose in all of it is that we might fear him and return to him as his people and depend upon him and trust him and become desperate for him. And that's what he has done throughout history with his people. In Nehemiah, we see uh, a season when Nehemiah is ministering as a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Uh, uh, and of course, a couple of generations beyond the Babylonian captivity and uh, he, didn't, he chose not to go and return uh, to Jerusalem, but to serve in that capacity, which was a very prominent position. Uh, they're very, working very closely with the king in captivity. Now, what you've got to see about Nehemiah is that Nehemiah was experiencing the favor of God in his life. He had been faithful in his life to the Lord, and the Lord was honoring that. Uh, this was a season and a time uh, when God was at work. He was at work uh, through his devastation uh, in the hearts and lives of his people. And what you'll see is that Nehemiah becomes an instrument in the hand of God to, to bring his people back to himself, to, to restore the walls, to restore the gates. Uh, but more than that, to restore... The, the spiritual vitality in the lives of God's people and their dependence on the Lord through his holy word. So it, it was a very pivotal moment in time. God does some of his greatest work in the hearts of his people uh, in, in some of the darkest times. This was a very dark time in the life of the people of God. But you got to remember that. There is no pit too deep there is no darkness too dark for God to pull his people up out of it and to forgive them and to cleanse them and to bring them into a, a, a life of renewal. There is, there is no pit that's too deep for that to happen. There is no sin that God can't pull somebody out of. 
And this is what we see with the people of God in this day. They were devastated by the Lord. And so uh, we're going to look at this first chapter here, verses 1 through 11, uh, this evening. And uh, we'll get started into it. But what you'll see here, revival comes through devastation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is uh, alive. It is, uh, oh Lord, very pointed in our lives as your people. Your word brings us to points of decision. Your word brings us to uh, understand, uh, Lord, our day and our hour and our, our, our season in which you have placed us in this world, our, our, our place, oh God, our kairos moment. And God, I pray that tonight that we would see more clearly what you're doing, not only through our lives, but through the life of your church right here, through the life of your church across America, oh God. Wilt thou not thyself revive us again, that we thy people shall rejoice in thee? We pray that out of, out of the devastation, out of the time, O oh Lord, that uh, may be ahead of us as your people, that you will work and send a great movement of your Holy Spirit. O oh God, we ask of you that you would have mercy upon us, and that you, O oh God, in this hour, in this time, would pour out your mercies. Your mercies endureth forever, O Lord. You are a God of great mercy. You are a God of great grace. You are a God who is long-suffering. You're a God, O God, who, who relents often concerning the calamity that you're going to bring toward your people. O Lord, we ask that you would truly kindle within our hearts a desire to become desperate before you, even in the midst of devastation, to seek you with all of our hearts, O oh God, that you might be found. So speak tonight, we pray, for we, your servants, listen. And we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, in Nehemiah, I want us to see a number of things here tonight. First of all, I want us to see the conversation between Nehemiah and the delegation uh, from the homeland uh, and understand here the reason for this conversation. Verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, <clears throat> it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th years, I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Henani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who were left, who are left from the captivity in the province, are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates are burned with fire. Now, I want us to begin tonight by looking at the reason for the conversation. The first reason for the conversation is the devastation of Jerusalem and the people of Judah uh, by God. That's the reason. The very reason that they are having this conversation that the delegation from Jerusalem has come all the way to uh, if you will, <clears throat> to Mesopotamia to meet there with uh, Nehemiah is because God had brought judgment down upon his people, Judah, in, as they departed from him. This is the result of the hand of God. We do not like that. Judgment theology is not something that we talk a whole lot about in the American church. We like the prosperity gospel a whole lot more. But judgment theology is real, and we see that God did bring judgment to his people, 
and he did take them into captivity, the Babylonian captivity. We saw last night that Isaiah uh, had come, had to come to grips with the, his new mission, and his new mission was that he was to be prophesying. He was to be a prophet among the people who had now crossed the line into the judgment of God. It was going to happen, and God would take them into judgment. And, and, and take them and destroy them. He would take them into exile and he would destroy the homeland and he would carry people off to, into exile and people's lives would be destroyed and families would be separated. It would be a very terrible time in the lives of the people of God. And this is the very reason for the conversation that they would have that between Hanani and Nehemiah. Because Hanani had become so burdened that the people of God, even after there, there was, uh, if you will, a time when the people in uh, captivity came back to Jerusalem and they had attempted to rebuild... They had attempted to, in, in, uh, to bring about Yahweh worship again, but it wasn't happening. There was great turmoil among the people of God. There was great, uh, if you will, uh, distress among them. And so Hanani, because of the judgment of God and because of the situation in the homeland, sensed the leadership of God to go to ask someone for help. Now, what we know now is not only the reason for this conversation is <laughs> the Lord uh, and his judgment, but we also know that the reason for this conversation was the providential work of God in redeeming his people, restoring his people. And so what we see here is at just the right time, you know, isn't that amazing how God works that? He raises up Hanani to be so burdened that he is willing to risk his life and the life of, his, of, of, of the cohorts that went with him. And they would travel in dangerous, <laughs> across dangerous land and they would go to meet with Nehemiah. Now that was dangerous in and of itself. Nehemiah didn't have to see them. Nehemiah could have them put to death. But Nehemiah didn't. Nehemiah was receptive, and at just the right time, Nehemiah was in a place and in a position to be able to help Hanani and the people back in the homeland. That's the providential hand of God. God had raised him up for such a season, for such a time as that. God always uses people. He will always raise up people for his catalyst to accomplish his work through his providential hand working to restore and redeem his people. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe with all my heart that God is doing that. And uh, he's raising up people. And uh, he, he's raising up people to be instruments in his hand of revival. One of them is Fred Lunsford. I told you about him earlier this week, 95-year-old World War II veteran in the western part of our state, <laughs> tremendous man of God, walks with the Lord. He is uh, a precious, precious man of the Lord. And uh, he stormed the beach of, beaches of Normandy and he fought in the Battle of the Bud, survived it, and uh, has such a heart and passion for God. And uh, he'll walk with God in such a way that oftentimes he, he is uh, in a conversation with you and then he'll cut into a conversation with God. I mean, it's precious. And I, I, uh, God is using him to call his people to pray for revival and awakening. So God uses instruments. He's always used instruments in revival and spiritual awakening. And so God has raised up Hanani to go. But he also had raised up Nehemiah to be, to be there so that Hanani would have somewhere to go for help. And, and what kind of role would God use you in as an instrument of revival? How would God orchestrate in your life an opportunity to be used of him 
for revival in this place. And so what we see here is not only the devastation of God, but we also see the providential hand of God. Now, I want, I want you to see something here, uh, if you will, um, about that devastation. The scripture is very descriptive here. It is a season of distress, and it is a season of reproach. Now, those two terms are used together here. One of them describes distress, the term distress, describes this inner spiritual famine that's taking place in the land. In other words, there's lawlessness that's happening right there in Jerusalem, the people of God. The people of God are, are not a holy people. They're not walking with God. Uh, they, are, they are walking in, uh, in, in an ungodly way in their community. But also, there is, there is this reproach the, those two terms used describe an inward, an inward spiritual uh, lack of holiness, but also an outward source of, 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 of uh, if you will, despair in their lives. So what do you have there is that you have the people of God, they're acting lawless, they're, they're not obeying the commandments of God, and then you have people from the outside enemies coming in because the gates are down and because the walls are down. The people are being pillaged and, and, and the Lord knows what all. Uh, and there's great unrest in the land. So you get this picture here of what is taking place. Hanani has come in a desperate way to relay to Nehemiah what's happening in the homeland. Now, this is God's divine providential work in this season. So he's brought the two together. All right, secondly, what happens? How does Nehemiah respond to this? Now, you've got to remember something. You, you know that Nehemiah knew about the homeland. He knew what was happening there. He knew that they, they were experiencing difficult times. But the scripture says in verse 4, So it was when I heard these words. Now I want you to notice something there. If you have your little pen, you can circle a word there. It's called heard. You see, at that moment, in that time, Nehemiah is bearing witness to something. He may have known about what was happening in Jerusalem, in the homeland. He may have known that Yahweh worship had not been restored and the walls were still down. But listen, he heard at that moment and that time the real situation in the homeland. When Hanani relayed the truth of what was happening, it was at that moment that Nehemiah heard it. And that word describes more than just listening. It describes all of a sudden it reached his heart. It pierced his heart. And all of a sudden Nehemiah realized that God was truly speaking into him. Remember the providential hand of God? God now was showing Nehemiah the situation from his perspective. Brothers and sisters, there are times that we hear reports of terrible, tragic news. We see it on the TV. We watch it. We, we, we understand the, the, the tragedy of sin in people's lives and how it destroys families. And, and we, we, we hear those reports. But there are other times when we really hear it. And it breaks our heart. I never forget when I was very young in the ministry. Uh, the man who was my mentor, Glenn Walker, uh, uh, he was pastoring in the Lenore area, and I went up to uh, to to give my testimony and to be able and preach. I think for him there at the church, and we spent the afternoon at his house. 
and my wife and our girls. And during the afternoon, he received a telephone call uh, from one of his members telling about uh, another one of his members who had just lost her husband. He was a truck driver and her daughter who was with him on a trip. And they've slid off an icy road off of cliff in the mountains and both were killed instantly. And I went with him as he went there to visit with the family that afternoon, to visit with this wife. And I can't tell you, I'd seen and heard about tragedies and been a, I, I was a park ranger. We had, we had people that were killed in car wrecks on the park and we had to deal with that and walk in that. And I, I can't describe to you what this news did to my heart. And I didn't even know this family. But all of a sudden, I heard it, and it broke my heart. And I wept right there with him and with his family as they all wept together about the devastation in their lives. And listen, Nehemiah, came to grips with the reality of the devastation of God. When you see that little word, I heard, <laughs> what you're going to see is how he responded because he came to grips with it. Have you come to grips with the devastation in our land from sin, the famine that's all over the place, all around us, the families that are being destroyed by sin, the communities that are are, are torn apart because of lawlessness. Has it gripped your heart? Has it, has it broken your heart? Because I want to tell you, what happened was Nehemiah responded in two ways. He was broken. First of all, the scripture says he heard these words when he heard it. Listen, when we hear it, when we really hear about the devastation in our land, the famine in our land spiritually, It'll break our hearts. We haven't heard it yet, have we? As the people of God, the church hadn't heard it in America yet. But I believe God will get us there. Now, the Bible says, <laughs> oh, Nehemiah, he says, I sat down and I wept. You ever sat down and wept? You ever been so broken on a situation you just sat down and you wept? He didn't cry. He wept. He mourned. It broke him. I mean, here he was. <laughs> Very high in the chain of leadership uh, with King Artaxerxes. Here he was. A Jew. And he heard about the homeland. And he heard about the spiritual condition of the people of God. And it broke him. He sat down. And he wept. And the scripture says, if you will, and he mourned for many days. And what you know from that is that this was not just a one-time little cry. This broke him. I mean, he was broken for days. For many days he was broken over the fact of the spiritual famine back in Jerusalem. The famine in the land, the people of God in great distress and turmoil. It tore him up. When's the last time we've been torn up over the famine in the land? Look what he says here. Secondly, not only was it broken, but it drove him to his knees. He says, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. <laughs> When's the last time we've become so broken over something that it drove us to our knees? We knew God was our only answer. And we knew that we had to hit our knees and look to the Lord. You see, that's where the church in America has got to get. We've got to get there. If we would see 
the lostness around us, that we would see the brokenness around us, that we would see the addictions around us, we would see the torn up families around us, and we would see it, we would become broken, and we would hit our knees with fasting and praying and desire God and his intervention so much, and we would know that he is the hope and he's the answer for the spiritual brokenness in our land. The body of Christ has the answer. But it had brought us to our knees to depend upon God to provide the solution to it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because Christ is the answer. You know that and I know it too. But we've got to become a people who hear and become broken and fasting and praying used together in scripture so often to focus our praying to show the seriousness of our heart for our dependence upon God well thirdly Nehemiah's humble God-centered prayer we've seen the reason for the conversation it was twofold <coughs> God's providential hand, the devastation that he brought. We've seen Nehemiah's response, and that was he was broken, and he prayed and he fasted. And now let's look at this great little prayer, and let's see what are the components of it. Well, first of all, it's God-centered, this prayer. Notice what he says, I pray, Lord God of, of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. It is all about God. You know, a lot of times our praying is all about us. And a lot of times it's always, oftentimes a lot about even the situation. But I want you to see this about the prayer of Nehemiah, that his beginning of this prayer is all about God. It's who God is. He, he focuses his heart on God. What could happen if the next time we went to our faces before a holy God and we focused our praying on him instead of us and what, he wanted, what we want him to do for us as his people? You see, oftentimes we want what God can do for us more than we want God. And what they are showing us in our praying is what Nehemiah shows us is he wanted God. He knew that he needed God. Do we know that we need God? But look at what his prayer is. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. He was, it was God-centered. And he says, your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, for your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. And we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. <laughs> Notice that. Oh, he begins with his own personal confession. Where did we see that before? With Isaiah, remember that? Started with me. Where does revival begin? It begins in my heart. It starts in your heart. But it's got to start with me understanding my sinfulness before a holy God. And he did. He said, he said me and my house, wow. I confess the sins of the children of Israel. Of Israel which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. And we hadn't kept your commandments. The people of Israel too, we have sinned. Brothers and sisters, if we're ever gonna see revival out of devastation, we're gonna see God raise us up out of a devastating time. We're gonna have to be a people who get honest with God about our sin and honest with God about the sin in the land in the people of God. But then notice something else here. Notice his appeal to the scriptures and appeal to 
the covenant relationship. Verse 8. Remember, I pray, the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are faith, unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, and though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. <laughs> now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. And he appeals to the relationship. It's all about the relationship. And what Nehemiah understands is that God's first priority in restoring his people is to bring them back to himself in relationship. And he appeals to God's promise. If you're unfaithful to me, I will scatter you. Do we really believe God will scatter us? We've got to believe it. It's biblical. God will judge us, y'all. We can cross the line and God will destroy us. Do we really think that God will allow us as his people in this nation to continue in our downward moral and spiritual decline without him judging us? He will destroy us if we do not repent and return to him. Now, Nehemiah understood that. He says, but your promise is also if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them. Though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. <laughs> In other words, I'll bring you back and restore you as my people. And what, a what a blessing. Out of the ashes, out of the ashes in Jerusalem, God can bring restoration. <laughs> Do we really believe that? Do we really think that our great God could send a mighty movement of his Holy Spirit where the church would be packed out, people hanging out in the windows wanting to hear the gospel where the church is truly thriving in the communities and truly the gospel is rapidly running across this nation? Do we believe God can do that? And then, <laughs> finally tonight, we see this, this, this thing that really took place in Nehemiah's heart. And I want you to see this. So this was his prayer. He, he just appealed to the Lord in the relationship, the covenant relationship, and God's restoration of that. And notice verse 11 now. Oh, Lord, I pray. This is, this, this is his ownership. There comes a point in the time that we've got to own the devastation and realize that we are an instrument that God can use in the midst of that devastation. Look at what the scripture says. Oh, Lord, I pray. Please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and to let your servant prosper this day. And I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah, he didn't, he didn't just hear. He didn't just weep. And pray. And appeal for the Lord to bring restoration. For his people to return to him. But now Nehemiah owned it. Because now Nehemiah said. God's tapped me. I can 
I can be an instrument. I can make a difference. In this day, I can be used of God for it. So Nehemiah said, God grant me favor. And we know what has happened here and what's going to happen. And Nehemiah is going to ask for the king's favor to leave his position. Now, do you realize how risky that is? He could have been accused of treason right there. He could have been accused of disloyalty to the king right there. And he could have had him executed in a moment right there. But he cried out, oh, Lord, grant me favor. He prayed a God-sized prayer because he owned it. He knew God was calling him to it. And he decided that he would fear God more than he would fear man. And he did. And his prayer was, God, grant me favor. And what did God do? He granted him favor. And he not only granted him favor. You know, when we pray God-sized prayers, brothers and sisters, God often answers exceedingly abundantly above what we could ever think or ask. Because God not only granted him favor with the king, God granted him passage. The king gave him supplies. The king blessed him as he was leaving and gave him a letter so that he might be able to pass freely through the different provinces. Oh my goodness, the Lord answered a God-sized prayer in an abundant way. God does that, doesn't he? And don't we praise him for it? And Nehemiah went, and as you walk through this great book, uh, he was able to lead the people despite opposition. Oh, he faced a lot of opposition to rebuild the wall, to rebuild the gates, to put them back up. And then, in chapter 8, he began to give attention to the most important thing. And you know what it was? The spiritual restoration of the people of God. And Ezra teamed up with him. The scripture says, and all the people gathered together as one man in the open square. And if you'll read on in chapter 8, you'll see that they stood in the reading of the word of God. There was this great, great attention now given to the reading of the word of God. To, to the word of the Lord. And the Bible says in verse 10 of, verse eight of chapter 8, and then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our God. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Revival has come to the people of God. They have returned to the Lord and the word of the Lord. Now look at, look at this, one last thing. Chapter 10, verse 29. And here is this picture of this returning to the Lord being complete with the people of God. He restored the gates and the, and the walls, gave attention to the spiritual life. The people of the Lord returned to the word of God. Now, verse 10, I mean chapter 10, verse 29, the scripture says, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in, the, in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes. In other words, what did the people do? They... They committed their lives anew and afresh to obeying and living and serving the Lord. Living the word of the Lord, the commandments of God. Obeying those commandments, living the word, and serving the Lord in their lives. And so this, this was a complete restoration of them. God did it. Now here's something that's interesting as we close. 
And I'll read a little story to you. And I know it's, it's past eight. But this is the last night y'all have to listen to me. <laughs> but listen. At this period in time in history, about 435, what we see taking place is a returning to the Lord by the people of God. Now this is important. Out of the devastation of exile, you've got to remember this. God devastated his people. God raised up, raised up leaders to bring his people back to him. They made a covenant, a curse, a blessing and a curse to walk in the commandments of God, committed to the word of the Lord. At this moment, there's a shift in, in, in Yahweh worship in Judaism, a shift where the word of God becomes primary. Now this is important over the worship of Yahweh in the temple. Now listen to me. The temple worship was important, but here the word of God became primary in their lives. They were going to obey the commandments of God. 435, what would happen over the next 400 years? No prophetic revelation of Scripture to the people of God. What we call the intertestamental period. The people of God were being prepared to be a people of the book during a period of time when there would be no prophetic revelation from God given to his people. And I don't know about you, but that the thing that sustained them, and what we do know from that intertestamental period, was this deep rooted commitment to the Word of God. And during that period of time, scribes copied and recopied and recopied the scrolls of the Word of the Lord. And so that when the Messiah they had the word of the Lord. And there were people like Simeon and Anna who had been taught the word of the Lord that there was a Messiah coming. <laughs> and his name was Jesus. And they were in the temple worshiping and waiting for him to come. The survival of, of, of Judaism, the survival of the word of the Lord, this revival was pivotal in preparing the people to be people of the book so that they might walk in 400 years of no prophetic revelation so that they would be prepared for the coming of the Christ. Brothers and sisters, when God devastates his people, we don't have any idea about what is ahead of us. When God sends revival among his people, we do not have any idea of what is ahead of us. But what we do know is that when God restores his people, he is wanting his people to be his people to a lost and a dying world. Will you be an instrument? Will this church be an instrument? Even in the midst of the judgment of God, would you be an instrument right here of revival? You know who it starts with? It starts with me. It starts with you. Will it? Nehemiah had to own it. Are we going to own it? 
Let's pray. God, thank you for this time in your word tonight. You are a faithful Lord who brings revival even in seasons of great devastation among your people. Devastation that you bring, oh God, because of their sin and their refusal to repent and return to you, oh Lord. And you have to judge them because they have been a stiff-necked people. They have been a rebellious people and they have refused to return to you. Oh Lord, I pray that it will not take your devastation in our lives as your people in America before we will return to you, Lord, before we will seek you with all of our hearts so that you might be found, that it will not take devastation, but before we will become desperate for you, O Lord, not what you can do for us, but for your mighty presence among us anew and afresh, that we will be a people, O Lord, who miss your mighty presence, your manifest presence, that we will be a people, O Lord, who are broken over the devastation of sin in our culture, over the spiritual famine in the land, O oh God, over the spiritual famine in our families, over the spiritual family in our communities. O oh Lord, will you help us to be a people who are broken over our own sin and over the sin in the land so that we might be a people who are fearing you more than we fear man and a people, O oh God, who will seek you with all of our hearts in these days, in these hours. So God, do it, O oh Lord. Begin it right here. Start in someone's heart right here, O oh Lord. Start in this church, O oh God. It's got to start somewhere. Why not right here, O oh Lord? We pray and we thank you. And all God's people said, amen. Tonight I invite you, your pastor is going to be down front. The altar is here. And Christian, I ask you, will you be an instrument of revival? For God to use, will you own the famine in the land? Will you be a people who are broken because of the sin in your own lives and in the life of this nation? Will we be a people who truly God raises up out of the ashes. God raises up out of the darkness to be used for his glory and his honor. Will we? Will you? You come as God leads your heart. Let's stand. And if we can, let's just have a, a time of silence. And I don't want, no, just no talking. Nothing. Your pastor will be here. If you need to come talk to him, that's fine. But just silence before the Lord. And let him speak for a season. And then your pastor will close as he sees the need. So let's just stand and listen to the Lord.
every single dream I lay each one down at your feet every moment of my wandering never changes what you see I've tried to win this war I confess my hands are weary I need your rest mighty warrior king of the fight no matter what I face you're by my side when you don't move the mountains I've needed you to move when you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through when you Truth is you know what tomorrow brings There's not a day ahead you have not seen So in all things be my life and breath I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less When you don't move the mountains strength and comfort you are my steady hand you are my firm foundation the rock on which I stand your ways are always higher your plans are always good there's not a place that I'll go you've not already stood when you don't move the mountains I needed you to move when you don't part the waters I wish I Trust in you.